after we left yesterday. Uh, for those of you who attended my talk on portal hypertension, I was very particular about very good contrast imaging in the CT scan. It's very pertinent when you are imaging a patient for GI bleed also. Now, I will show you an example. This is not a case of GI bleed, but of FTC. This particular patient was sent across to us with this CT scan. In the arterial phase, you can hardly see anything in the liver. In the venous phase, if you look carefully, maybe at this particular point, you can appreciate focal area of washout. So with this kind of imaging, you cannot classify any variant. We repeated the CT scan. Now, that's what you see. That's the early arterial phase. Yes, something barely is perceptible. But if you look at the late arterial phase, this very well arterially enhancing region is seen, which is showing washout in the later phases. So this is the quality of imaging that we expect from everyone. Believe you me, at the end of your uh, radiology curriculum, you all will be joining some centers or some hospitals, and there will be places where, where you come across people who will say that let's go low on contrast because that's economic for them. They want to save money, but never compromise on the quality of imaging. You will burn your hands. So always insist that, yes, if this patient needs 120 ml of contrast, I will do the scan using this much. The timing of the contrast that's in your own hand, you've got to teach your radiology technician. Don't depend upon the technician to do the scanning unless you have taught them well. So we come to uh, the GI bleed, back to our topic. In your exam, you might get some image like this or like this. Well, you will see a lot of areas of flexion. There's one catheter going on inside. The pancreas may not look good. This is a MIP image. Uh, so you can easily come to a diagnosis of pancreatitis. But once you have come to this diagnosis, if you fail to miss this area of contrast extravasation, it's a sin. Because this is a critical alert which you have to tell to the clinicians or to the interventional radiologist so that immediate action can be taken and the patient's life can be saved. So whenever you see cases of pancreatitis, you must try and identify is there any site of arterial extravasation. Even if you don't identify it later on, if that's a long case for you, the examiner can always ask you what are the expected complications and Arterial bleed is one of the common complications seen in patients with pancreatitis. So much so, uh, I may have embolized one patient thrice from three different vessels over a period of six months. So, how do we define the lower GI bleeding? That's the ligament of teeth, which tells us where the upper GI bleeding ends and where the lower gut starts. Basically, upper GI bleed involves esophagus, stomach, and duodenum, and the lower GI bleed involves Everything from jejunum, ileum, and colon. So that's the pictorial description of the ligament trees that's going at the DJ flexure. So everything proximal to this is upper GI, and distal is lower GI bleed. And if you look at the epidemiology, upper GI bleed is far more common as compared to the lower GI bleed. And 80% of the bleeds, both upper and lower, are self-limited or they are managed with the endoscopic interventions. It's only 5 to 10% of the patients who need IR intervention to manage their bleeding. And when they need it, they desperately need it. So there should be no compromise. If you get a call at night that there's a patient who's bleeding and a CT has to be reported, do not hesitate. That can make the difference of life and death to that patient. The mortality rate of lower GI bleeding is about 10%. Most of these are elderly patients, 63 to 77 years. And when does IR come into play? When endoscopy fails. It's not that these patients are directly taken up for angiography. First, you always try the conservative management. And if it fails, then IR comes into play. So what are the common causes of the lower GI bleed? The anatomic diverticulosis, as Dr. Summer had earlier mentioned, there could be microbial diverticulum. And these all can be identified on CT scan, or you might need a radionuclide scan. There can be vascular causes as angiodysplasia or ischemic or radiation induced inflammatory in inflammatory bowel disease. There could be Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, which can cause bleed or neoplastic with a common polyps after polypectomy or a carcinoma. So how do we go about looking at the patients when they present to us with a lower GI bleed? First of all, we need to really be sure. Is it an upper GI bleed or a lower GI bleed? Sometimes massive upper GI bleed can also present as a lower GI bleed. 
So if we are in any doubt, we need to definitely get an upper GI scopy to rule out upper GI bleeds. Next, mainstay is colonoscopy, but it's not done in, you know, in very urgent situations, though there are some debatable articles. I'll be discussing them later on. Normally, you stabilize the patient, wait for the colon to clear, and then you go ahead and do the colonoscopy. Otherwise, all that you will see is blood in the colon, and you will not be able to make any, any sensible decision on that colonoscopy. If colonoscopy has failed, the next thing comes CT angiography. It can detect a bleeding rate of 0.5 to 1 ml per minute, and the sensitivity is 62 to 72%. And if CT angiography has already told us where the bleed is, obviously, then the next step would come as a capture angiogram, which can detect bleeding rates of more than 0.5 ml per minute, and the sensitivity is 40 to 75 percent. The advantage of capture angiogram is you can diagnose it and treat it. But uh, I'll show you another slide where I'll tell why it's important to do a CT angiography before doing catheter angiogram. However, in cases of obscure GI bleed, when we are not able to come to any conclusion on upper GI scopy or on colonoscopy and CT angiography is negative, we might want to do technetium RBC scintigraphy, which can detect bleeding at a rate of 0.1 ml per minute and the sensitivity is about 85%. Though the problem is it's not a very specific test. It won't be able to give you the exact location. But once it's done, the nuclear medicine guy can discuss with the interventional radiologist and the final treatment can be planned out. Sometimes uh, the, uh, on endoscopy, they feel the bleeding is so massive that uh, you, we may have to bypass the uh, CT protocol and directly take up the patient for a catheter angiogram. So how do we go about this protocol? If the patient is clinically stable, then he undergoes the endoscopic procedures and if that is negative, then the patient is taken up for capsule endoscopy. If capsule endoscopy is negative, the re-bleeding rate is less than 6%, which is pretty good. So what are the endoscopic procedures which these patients can be taken up for? You can do flexible sigmoidoscopy, colonoscopy, capsule endoscopy, or small bowel endoscopy. The advantage is treated in the same sitting. However, if the lower gut is all clear, then you need to repeat your upper GI scopy to confirm that there is no bleed from the upper gut. Now, as I was discussing earlier, that there, there is some concept about urgent colonoscopy. There was a landmark study which had been published in 2000, and they, they showed that the frequency of detecting a bleed was higher in case an urgent colonoscopy was done. Similar RCT was done later on, which also proved their version. And, and this, this RCT showed that uh, the positivity rate was 42% versus 22% in delayed colonoscopy. However, this RCT concluded there was no significant difference in important outcomes as far as mortality or hospital stay or total PRBC requirement was concerned, whether the colonoscopy was done early or later on. Another RCT was done later on to be able to verify the effects of these previous two studies. And they also concluded that there's no evidence of improved clinical outcomes with urgent colonoscopy, but pre-specified sample size was not read in this particular study. So as of now, we are unclear whether urgent colonoscopy is really required or not, but it, it's all dependent upon the patient uh, situation. Still, if it's a massive bleed, there is Actually, no point in doing an urgent colonoscopy. I guess doing a CT angiogram will make more sense. And that's, that's an image from a tagged RBC scan. It's more accurate when done, you know, when the patient has ongoing bleeding or it is done within uh, two hours of the onset of the bleed. So that's a CT. Uh, uh, once the uh, technician scan has told us about the site of the bleed, the patient is taken up for angiography, and it can detect, as mentioned earlier, rate of 0.5 to 1 ml per minute. It has the therapeutic capability. We can do embolization using a lot of materials, microcoils, PVA particles, or gel foam. However, there is one flaw with the uh, treatment with angiography. If you treat too much, if you, if you are not super selective, you might end up embolizing more than three vasa recta, which can cause bowel infarction, uh, which can 
ultimately again uh, demand a surgery for the patient for gut resection. So we have to be very careful, especially when we are treating patients with low GI bleed in how much area are we embolizing. The other uh, flaw with the tetraangiogram, you might end up using a whole lot of contrast and the patient can end up with renal failure. Obviously, in all these patients, we need to be uh, very careful about uh, taking the femoral puncture if required because these patients have lost blood, the femoral pulse may be feeble. So do not hesitate to use ultrasound to do, take the femoral puncture rather than creating another problem at the femoral end. So these are, uh, that's, that's a CT angiogram, which is demonstrating this particular area in the uh, hepatic flexure of active extravasation of contrast. Why is CT scan important? It will give us a lot of information. It will tell us about the site of the bleed, the cause of the bleed. We might see a bleed on an angiogram, but I may not know that this is angiodysplasia, or there's a tumor, or there's an ulcer, or the pseudoanism obviously will be very clearly seen. The CT will give me the arterial anatomy and it might show me the branch which is causing the extravasation. More than that, it will also tell me in cases of angiodysplasia that whether it's a single lesion or there are multiple lesions. When there are multiple lesions, we do not touch all of them. If, if a patient has 20 angiodysplasia, which is a common thing in these patients, we will treat only the lesion which is actively bleeding. That's an important thing to remember. You do not treat non-bleeding angiodysplasia. In fact, if there is only one site of angiodysplasia, the ideal treatment will become resection anastomosis for these patients. That's a surgical uh, case. But if the, if the patient has lost a lot of blood and uh, the time is dire, then you should embolize this particular lesion and later on the patient can undergo surgery. Now, the importance of a CT angiogram. If a patient who is bleeding in any part of the body comes to us, if I have to do a direct catheter angiogram, how many vessels will I interrogate? If it's a low GI bleed, I think I'll do the SMA angiogram. I'll take a injector run. I will do IMA run. And then I'll go in, into the celiac artery and take a injector celiac run. These are the three major vessels which are thought to be culprit. But there are times when it's not any of these vessels. There could be phrenic artery, there could be intercostal artery, there could be a lumbar artery which is bleeding, there could be an aberrant artery anywhere else. So that's where CT comes into play. If the CT is able to demonstrate the site of active extravasation or the pseudoaneurysm, as you can see in this particular case, this was the inferior phrenic artery pseudoaneurysm, which it would have taken me a whole lot of time to identify, and I would have used a whole lot of contrast since CT had already told me in phrenic artery and the location of the origin of the phrenic artery, I directly went into the phrenic artery and that's the good result. You go in and embolize. You save a lot of time, radiation, contrast, and you save the patient's kidney also. What is the role of surgery for lower GI bleed? Well, surgery is reserved for patients with life-threatening bleed who have failed other options. However, sometimes the patient is so sick and you do have a probable site of bleed, like it's a post cholecystectomy bleed or a you're suspecting a GDA stump blowout bleed, and you the patient may not have enough time to be brought from ICU to the cath lab while all the arrangements are made and angiography is done and the bleeding is stopped. So these patients can be directly taken up for surgery also. So that's the algorithm. Uh, to evaluate a patient with hematochezia, we assess the activity of the bleed. If it's active bleed, always rule out the upper GI bleed by nasogastric lavage if that's negative. And still you feel that there is risk of upper GI bleed, the patient undergoes upper GI endoscopy. If this is negative, then you decide what next if the patient is hemodynamically stable. If the patient is stable, then you ask for if either an urgent colonoscopy or an interval colonoscopy, as we have discussed. And if the patient is not stable, we do a CT angiogram. And if even that's not possible, we directly take up for angiography and then treat the patient accordingly. So as mentioned earlier, whenever possible, always ask for CT angiogram, never refuse a CT angiogram. In fact, even if the creatinine levels are high and the patient is bleeding, remember it's a life-saving procedure we have to do a CT angiogram so that patient can be taken up for the catheter angiography. 
what are the indications for interventional radiology to step in failure of endoscopy or significant rebleeding after endoscopic treatment either the first or the second attempt or if the patient is requiring more than five transfusions every 24 hours or we may decide to step in early if the patient is elderly and has multiple comorbidities that's the yield of angiography 50 to 75 percent and as a lot of literature angiography has been the gold standard test for detection of acute life-threatening gi hemorrhage now coming to the hardware which is required to treat patients of low gi bleed there are various symbolic materials which can be used that's gel foam these are the pva particles these are the coils which are frequently used then there is histocryl n butyl cyanoacrylate which is used in combination with lipidol and these are amplexer plugs these are not very commonly used for the low gib but there may be instances where we might require them so uh, taking all of them one by one pva particles come in various sizes as you can see on these bottles 45 to 150 and 250 So these smaller sizes are what we are using for the low GI bleed because, as I told you earlier, we want the embolic material to reach into that particular vasa recta, which is the culprit. I do not want to embolize one of the primary feeders. We have to reach to the secondary or tertiary level. Uh, there are articles which say we should not be embolizing more than three vasa recta in one sitting. Otherwise, we are exposing the patient to higher risk of ischemic injuries and while we are talking about pva particles the bigger particle particles of 355 to 500 or 500 to 700 these are the particles which are used for uterine artery embolization or bronchial artery embolization embolization to protect either the spinal artery or the ovarian artery as the case may be and the smaller particles have higher frequency of going into these branches and embolizing them the other embolic material that can be used is gel foam a lot of times we end up doing angiogram we know that it's the uh, descending colon which is the culprit that there's a lesion there but we do not see active extravasation and we do not see any pseudoaneurysm so what do we do in those cases but the patient is bleeding uh the technician uh, cytography scan also might be positive uh, for the left colon so if we are not able to identify the site of bleed on angiography we still go into the ima into the left colic artery and if, if the lower part go into the recta in the lower part and non selectively we use gel foam gel foam is a temporary embolizing agent it's not a permanent embolizing agent so it can get recanalized in a matter of 3 to 4 days so we temporarily embolize the vasa recta of the affected area a lot of times the patient settle down only with this temporary embolization because the main artery which is actually causing the bleed gets embolized and there is a clot formation and healing takes place within this much short interval and the bleeding stops as mentioned earlier we use uh, glue along with uh, lipidol which is one of the commonest thing which is used for embolizing uh, the bleeder in the lower gi tract what are the common catheters which are used that's a long list of catheters which you will find in all of your books but most commonly we use either sim1 or c1 catheter because the bleed will be either from the superior mesenteric artery or inferior mesenteric artery the superior mesenteric artery has a downward course so invariably we end up using a sim1 catheter but if it's a very wide curve we might want to use a sim2 catheter but these are the two catheters which are the mainstay for the procedure but since as i mentioned to you earlier we need to embolize the tertiary uh, branches or the branch which is actually causing the problem through these guiding catheters we use micro catheters which can be ranging anywhere from 1.9 to 2.7 french and they take an oven core wire through it these are coaxially uh, passed through the guiding catheter that's one of the example the prograde catheter that comes in various sizes if if you are not planning to go very deep you already know it's a superficial uh, it's one of the bigger branches you can use a 2.7 french prograde catheter or and if you know you want to go deeper there's a sl10 which is a neuro catheter which can go up to 1.9 french so you will prefer to use that though for low gi bleed you may not want uh, a covered stent graft but well that should be in stock as 
sometimes uh, you'll come across very funny situation the way we had once seen there was a direct uh, fist law between SMA and SMB along with the pseudonymism. So we coil immobilize the pseudonymism and put a covered stent graph in the SMA to block the fist law between SMA and SMB. Now sometimes we will fail to demonstrate bleed even on a catheter angiogram. But we know the patient does have intermittent bleed. There has been a documented fall in hemoglobin. So what do we do for these patients? Provocative angiography. This is a very good technique where you give pharmacological agents to provoke bleeding. But whenever we are doing this procedure, we need to be absolutely ready with our material to embolize. Because sometimes these patients can have torrential bleed and you can't waste time in these patients. This procedure was first described by Roche et al. in 1982 and later on they published a larger study of 63 cases in 1986. And now in 2010 there was another even larger study where the advantages of the provocative mesentric angiography was discussed. So how do we do it? Once we have reached the probable location of the branch which we think is the culprit as per the CT or on pancreatitis we see some hazy uh, branches of that particular artery. It may be in pancreatic duodenal or any other branch. So after taking my micro there, we will give intravenous heparin anywhere from 2,000 to 6,000 international units. Wait for about two minutes of uh, installation of heparin. And then I start giving NTG, nitroglycerin up to 200 microgram diluted in 10 ml from my micro -cassiter. Some people also use papaverine, one milligram. Again, another vascular dilator. And we wait for five minutes and repeat an angiography. Sometimes because of spasm, these vessels do not show the bleed. But once your angiography is over, they keep slowly oozing out. So heparin and NTD combination can dilate the vessel and it can start showing bleeding on table. However, if even after, after this challenge, you don't see a bleed, the next step is use of tissue plasma imaging activator. The LT place is used anywhere from 1 to 30 milligram, depending upon the patient weight. Commonly, 6 to 8 milligram is given. It gets infused into the artery, which is suspect, with, at a slow infusion over 1 to 5 minutes. And after waiting for 5 to 10 minutes, post installation of TPA, we take an angiogram and a lot of times it does reveal the bleeder. The positivity rate of provocative angiogram has been listed to be anywhere from 30 to 50 percent. But well, there are some contraindications. You must remember not to use provocative angiography if the patient has undergone a major surgery or a biopsy within seven days or any patient of trauma within last 10 days or there's history of recent stroke or any neurological surgery. Now I will, I'm showing you an example. Basically this is an upper GI bleed, but still it's very important uh, to be able to understand how critical things can become when we are talking about the GI bleeds. This patient had presented to us post lap cholecystectomy and the CT angiogram had demonstrated uh, pseudoaneurysm from the uh, right hepatic artery. The catheter angiogram was done and you could very well see the pseudoaneurysm. But while taking the runs, and by the time the micro catheter reached just proximal to the pseudoaneurysm, when the run was taken, this pseudoaneurysm ruptured, and you could see active extravasation of contrast. Well, this was the picture. The patient started vomiting out blood. Every place was full of blood. The pulse rate shot to 180, and BP fell to 90 by 55. And, and I'm sure you can understand the interventional radiologist BP rises in equal proportions when, when this happens on table. But as I said, you should always be ready with your embolization material so you do not waste time in trying to find it all out. We were ready with the micro coils. Uh, these are 018 coils, come in various sizes. You have to, you can upsize 20 to 30 percent after taking the vessel diameter. So that was the coiling which was done. This is called as the sandwich technique. You start from the distal end and keep coiling up to proximal part. In case you're not able to cross over to the distal part, but your contrast is going across. So it's very important to, uh, to close both the end. Otherwise, you can get retrograde filling later on if you just embolize the proximal part. But remember this at uh, this point, if, if the examiner asks you, you have to close the aneurysm 
from both the ends. So if you're not able to cross, you come up to this point and it will be better to use a dilute lipidol glue combination, maybe about 40-50%, uh, which can go across the uh, pseudonism site and block the pseudonism from both ends. The only disadvantage of uh, glue lipidol combination is you have to be uh, very good at using it. You should have a second uh, hand who will pull out the micro catheter once your gluing is done. Because if you're not careful, you can end up embolizing even the celiac artery while pulling out the micro catheter using glue. So that's another case. This patient had a cecal ulcer, and you can see there's extravasation from multiple points, and that's coil embolization, which is in process, and that's glue also, which has been in injected into another bleeder. So at the end of the procedure, you can see all the bleeders have been attended to. It's important to know your arterial anatomy, as you can see in this particular image, because if the descending colon is involved or the ascending colon is involved, you know which arteries you need to interrogate, because if you know this, that's how you will be able to do a provocative angiogram also in these particular patients. So don't forget your anatomy. And as I mentioned, why you need to close your uh, all the pseudonym from both the ends. So there are multiple collaterals, bridging collaterals. As you can see, there are collaterals between SMA and the uh, common hepatic artery. That's through the GDA, the superior pancreatic urinal arcade and the inferior pancreatic urinal arcade. These all meet up. In fact, even you can get uh, feeds from the uh, pancreatic artery, from the splenic artery. So unless you have closed all possible ends uh, for the pseudonym or the active extravasation, you should not close your angiogram. Now, these are particular things uh, like, as I mentioned earlier, these are tiny brushes you may not be able to reach with your catheter. Do uh, bland gel foam embolization. That's another patient of a colonic bleed. Uh, again, multiple sites, coil embolization. Now, this is another patient of pancreatitis who presented with a pseudonym at the middle colic artery. And that's the angiogram. Since it's an AP view, it's difficult to appreciate. But if you look at it carefully, you will find contrast is retaining in this particular pseudonym. So that's how you identify it. It was, again, a simple case, went ahead. Uh, distally started coiling and came proximally, and this uranism was taken. So while I've spoken a lot about the arterial and the uh, tumorous causes for bleeding, let's not forget the venous system as we had discussed yesterday. There could be a journal or jejunal varix, which can, could be the cause for the bleed. Now, if you look at this CT scan, you will be able to identify this case. This patient is cirrhotic, there is a situs. and partial thrombus in the portal vein. As you're coming down, you will start seeing, oh, that's a big varix in the D3 segment. So this was the cause of the bleeding in this patient. So how do you tackle these patients? Again, create a tips, go into the uh, recanalize, either if, if it's from uh, the superior mesentric vein or inferior mesentric vein, whatever the case be, you go into it, do either coil or glue embolization, and close the varix, this will stop the bleeding. Now in this angiogram, you see from SMV, it's being closed. There can be other ectopic varices also in any, any other place in the retroperitoneum. So the CT has another advantage, as I mentioned, never ignore the importance of CT before taking up a patient of GRB. So this, the CT had demonstrated a, a lower, a, a descending colonic varix. Again, we have gone trans tips, and that's the uh, glue embolization which has been done, and this is the check run which shows non-filling of the varix. Sometimes we can go ahead and do the direct puncture of the varix, as in this case of a jejunal varix, it was coming right up to the paritis. But while doing the direct puncture, uh, we need to take a venous access also, as has been done in this particular patient. The iliac run is seen, that's a direct puncture, that's glue embolization. Along with the glue, the track has been plugged with the coils. 
another patient of a stomal varix uh, these can uh, this can be difficult to treat a lot of people have spoken about percutaneous uh, uh, embolization of the stomal varix but still uh, we feel we need to go from the upper end also that steps in process tips has been created you may not actually put in a tip stent but you can use the tips route to access the left portal vein and the recanalized paraambulacral vein and that's what we have done through the paraambulacral vein we have reached up to the stomal varix and that's the coiling of all the feeders into the stomal varix and at the end everything has been coiled so i am done with my talk thank you so much for being attentive if there are questions open to them thank you sir for taking this important topic and sharing